Hi, I'm Dr. Rudy Cashman. I'm a neurosurgeon from former Indiana. I've been practicing here for 40 years, but I'm only 39 years old. Over these years, obviously, I've run across many uh, different uh, medical illnesses uh, and diseases, and I've learned uh, in quite a bit. The thing that interests me the most at this time, frankly, uh, is that I'd say 50 to 70 percent of the patients that I look at from day to day, that, and that other physicians, frankly, look at, have a physical presentation of stress. In other words, what I call them, they have mind-body diseases, diseases caused by or controlled by the mind. When you think of it, when 75 percent of the patients that we're looking at need a coach, that's all they need. They don't need anything fancy. And that's been of great interest to me. So I started writing books about it, doing DVDs about it, uh, and I formed the Mind Body Index. I legally own this name, and the reason I have this here uh, is to uh, tell patients and to teach physicians of illnesses that are partially or totally controlled by the mind. Irritable bowel, 20 million people. Fibromyalgia, probably 30 million people. Atypical chest pain, 75% of chest pain is due to stress. But the most interesting thing is that the mind also greatly affects your immunity. In other words, negative thinking can lead to cancer. And that is what we're going to speak about today, the mind in cancer. So if you yourself, or if you know someone that has cancer, tell them about my DVDs uh, that are available, readily available in my Mind Body Institute, uh, which I have downtown in, in the DeSoto Building and the Lufan Hospital, uh, where p cancer patients can go. We teach them stress reduction, visualization, imaging, uh, and, and we increase their hopefulness. I think the spontaneous cure rate goes up. But anyhow, let's go on to the lecture and uh, teach you something uh, about this. Tonight's talk is the mind in cancer. The mind uh, in, in cancer. How does the brain affect the body? How does the brain affect the body? How does the body affect the brain? Both speak to each other. And that's what I like to teach you. Every thought, every thought, conscious or unconscious, affects the physiology of your body. Just think of it. You get over the negative thought all day, your whole body becomes negative. If you're a happy person, your whole body becomes positive. Your mind can speak to your immunity. Yes, very interesting. Every physiological reaction of the body affects the brain subconsciously or unconsciously. Every thought affects your 60 trillion cells of your body. How you think affects every cell in your body. And I will eventually prove this to you. Every one of your six trillion cells eavesdrop on your every thought. Isn't that interesting? What is holistic medicine? You know you hear about it. We hear about CAM medicine, uh, complementary alternative medicine. I like the term holistic medicine because this is really uh, we're looking at the whole, the patient, the whole patient, not just a single organ. What is a holistic doctor? What does he do? He looks at the physiology of the patient, the blood sugar, the chest x-ray, the heart, the heart rate, uh, uh, etc. But he also looks at the physical aspect. The doctor touches you, examines you. But he also knows about your spirituality. You go to church. Do you, be do you believe how spiritual a person are you? Why is that important? because spirituality, I have found over the years, can lead to healing. A prayer can lead to healing. It can change the physiology of your body. So it's very important to know the spirituality of the patient. For example, if I'm going to do a brain tumor and the patient brings along a priest or a rabbi or whatever, I ask everyone to hold hands and say a prayer. Why do I do that? That patient is more likely to heal. It establishes a better relationship to the whole family. I do it every time. The next thing you consider is that each person is unique. We're all different. You've got to know your patient. I always tell medical students, new medical students, when a patient comes in, not to ask right away whether they're hurting here or there, but to look them square in the eye and to say, and what's going on in your life? You've got to know your patient. Did somebody just die? 
Did somebody just, did they lose a child in an accident? You gotta know these things. That's gonna affect the symptoms uh, that they have. Each person should be part of the decision-making team. You have to fully inform the patient, give them alt alternatives, uh, teach them to help them make a decision. Sometimes they haven't come back two or three times if it's gonna be a big case and we have time uh, to help them make up their mind. Sometimes send them for a second opinion. And the last thing to really to be a holistic doctor, you have to remember, the human being has tremendous self-healing abilities. Your body remembers what it's like to be well. Herb Benson publishes a great deal about that. The body remembers how to do well. So to teach mind-body techniques is extremely important. Let's look at mind-body, body-mind. How does the brain speak to the body? The brain speaks to the body through neuropeptides. Examples are thyroid stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, ACTH, adrenal cortical stimulating hormone made by the pituitary, hormones, estrogen, and testosterone, the hormones that stimulate in your glands, the stimulating hormones start in your brain. The stimulus from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland sends out the signals to the gland and the rest of your body and the secretion occurs. And neurotransmitters, they are the messengers that jump across the nerves that carry the messages throughout your body. Acetylcholine, the relaxer. Adrenaline, uh, the stressor. Those are neurotransmitters. So three things from your brain speak to your body. Neuropeptides, hormones, and neurotransmitters. An excellent book was published in 1972 by Candace Pert, P-E-R-T. She now is a physiology instructor at Georgetown University, where I took my residency in neurosurgery. Uh, she's the one that proved where external drugs we take or the drugs that we make in our own body. The biggest pharmacy in the world is your own body. It's your own body. Where do they have their effect? She discovered the receptor sites in your body. Your bowel has in it 400 million brain cells. Would you believe it? You think your bowel reacts. The heart has many of these receptor sites. Your skin, the biggest organ in the body, has many of these receptor sites. When I see stressed out people, a lot of times they have a rash. It's through the thought process affecting uh, their, their skin. And they're located throughout your body, including your muscles, you have receptor sites. Her book, Molecules of Emotion, How Your Brain Can Affect Your Emotions, uh, is an excellent book to read. I've read it two or three times. The next thing she discovered is the monocytes, the white blood cells uh, in your blood system, your, which regulate your immunity, that they also make all the neuropeptides your brain makes. Your brain makes about 350 neuropeptides, proteins, but the monocytes in your blood make them too. So your brain can speak to your immunity, positively or negatively. Remember Crystal Reeve died? His wife dies of lung cancer a year later. Never smoked, why is that? Her negative thinking destroyed her immunity. It's a very common uh, story. So what Candace Pert is saying, our mind affects our body, but she's also saying that body affects your mind that because of the monocytes making these neuro, 350 uh, neuropeptides. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about a psychoneuroimmunology, PNI. That's a field in itself now. Psycho, the, the mind, how it affects the rest of your body through immunology. It's very uh, interesting. It becomes so uh, uh, prevalent and so specific, they have departments of it now. For example, Mayo Clinic has a department of psychoneurodermatology, a whole department about how your brain affects your skin. Isn't that interesting? So a lot of skin diseases can be cured by anxiety reduction, by yoga, stress reduction. Don't necessarily need all these fancy uh, treatments. So your white cells, your monocytes, your T cells, your bone marrow, your spleen, and your thymus, that really is your immunity. This really is your army. This really are your Marines that fight the cancer cells. They fight off your cancer cells. You make cancer cells in your body every day. We all do, we all do. We normally, in our whole body, probably make a billion new cells a day. Would it be unusual? that a few abnormal cells are formed? No, it's not. So your white cells, your army and your marines destroy them immediately. That's called a surveillance theory. 
so your Army, Navy, and Air Force can be influenced by your thoughts, positively or negatively. I had an AIDS patient years ago, and I taught him these techniques, so Candace Perlman educated him. 20 years later, he never converted. He's a very optimistic individual. His thinking process is very positively. He works out. He does exercise. And I think he improved his immunity. Uh, very interesting. There's a book written uh, by a gentleman named Hutchenegger that wrote a book called The Will to Live. The Will to Live is extremely uh, important uh, to prevent cancer, inflammatory uh, diseases. Is there any history to the mind in cancer? How far back do we go? People have been talking about the mind in cancer 2,000 years ago. Aristotle talked about it. Hippocrates talked about it. But in, 19, uh, but in 1846, Dr. Walter Heil uh, published articles about the nature and treatment of cancer. It was very clear to him, questioning its reality would have seemed a struggle against reason, he said. 1846. 1865, Dr. Claude Bernard, he said, a human being must be considered a harmonious whole. See, 300 years ago, Descartes, a famous scientist like Newton, cut the head off the body. He gave the head to the church and the body to science. The trouble with that is that it, great, the brain has tremendous effects on the body, so for 300 years, we've been really treating diseases and illnesses and forgetting this thing is connected to the human body. But look what Kenneth Perry proved. 350 neuropeptides, neurotransmitter hormones affect your body. So that's been incorrect. And we've had a hard time even today to correct that. It's taught very little in the medical school, very little. Wellness is not taught much in the medical school. I asked the medical students there recently. They said, well, a little bit in my sophomore year. It's sad Then 75% of patients I'm looking at need a coach. I tell my patients every day. I did today. I told three patients. Now, you know, I'm your coach. I tell you, honestly, patients love that. I get a smile every time I say that. And one of my patients responded, you realize you've been coaching 12 of our family members. I thought it was very entertaining because I didn't remember them all. And that was, I thought, a real compliment. In 1870, Paget said, depression plays a vital role in cancer as well as in anxiety and hopelessness, which increase the cancer growth. Cancer is much more common in stressed out people. 1893, Snow published the first statistical proof of increased rate of cancer in a group of 250 patients. In 156, there was recent severe stress, loss of relative, divorce, or death. Cancer rate went up. Somebody died. Somebody gave me a divorce. Cancer rates picked up. Very interesting. And you'll find this fascinating. Patients with severe mental disease like schizophrenics, idiots, or lunatics, have a low rate of cancer. They don't think. They don't think. Very low cancer rate. It's been proven by studies in mental institutions. Paranoids who think too much have a much higher rate of cancer than normal people. So that is proof that the mind affects your immunity, can affect uh, your cancer rate. Carl and Stephanie Simonton pu published uh, books, Getting Well Again is a book they published. Any cancer patient, I say, should read this book. It's the first book I tell people to read. Uh, I think it's an excellent book. It, it's been around for many years. He studied 159 patients, and he, and he found it is more important to know what kind of person has it, what kind of person has a disease, than what disease the patient has. My God, isn't that interesting? What do we do today? We head for the CT and the MRI. We never talk to that person. You can see how ridiculous that is. My 40 years of medical practice, I found talking to people extremely important, the most important thing. Cancer patients live twice as long if they are taught mind-body medicine. And I'll tell you what that means shortly. It's an interesting. This is what Simonton found. And you can read his book. The proof is there. Many great stories in there. Let's look at cancer a minute. 30 to 40 percent are cured by modern Western medicine. Remember, I'm for modern Western medicine. For Pete's sake, don't give up that over mind-body medicine. Get it every time. No, no potential complications. Know what it can do. And, and, and please, uh, follow the Western, Western uh, recommendations. Totally agree with this. When I talk about mind medicine, mind-body medicine, I'm talking about in addition to. But one patient dies and the other doesn't, although they have the same disease. Why does it occur? One's a positive thinker, one's a negative thinker. One destroyed his immunity, the other didn't. Patients who are taught mind-body medicine live twice as long. Lachan proved that in his book. 
when he studied terminal cancer for 45 years. Very interesting. They have higher rates of spontaneous cures. I didn't say mind-body medicine cures people, but the spontaneous cure rate goes up. I've seen it. Let's talk about spontaneous remission, where they, all of a sudden uh, they have this cancer spread all the body, and bang, it disappears. How does it happen? No one knows for sure. No one knows for sure. That may be, it's not a common thing, but actually it may, it may be more common than we think because we don't know people who may have been cured of their cancer uh, and have presented with symptoms. We don't know that rate when we really know that we all form some cancer cells every day and our immunity destroys them. So I suspect there's a much higher rate of that than we really know. Let's talk a little, little bit about placebo and nocebo. Placebo can be a pill. You believe the pill works, 75% chance the pill can cure you. It can be totally inert. It can be totally inert. Placebo means to heal, uh, to heal. It can be a pill. It can be a loving doctor. If you treat a patient, talk to them, and a loving doctor, I know, there's no question about it over the years, I placeboed a lot of patients because they get the impression I love them. And it's, I do. I tell my patients I love them many times. I did today. And they say it back to me. I care, f I care for them. That's the reason I'm doing here what I'm doing. Uh, and it has healing power to it. Nocebo is the opposite. It's the opposite. If you tell the patient too much about the CT and the MRI, uh, let me give an example. Uh, my son, who's a neurosurgeon, he said, you know, Dad, I think I saw a patient about what you're talking about. He, he saw a, a very nice lady, 35 years old, three children, no husband, that came up with a tiny tumor. It looked malignant on the scan. She asked, well, what could it be, doctor? Well, it looks malignant. How long I got to live? And he said, six months. Didn't see much else. She shouted screaming. She screamed all night. The next day, he biopsies the tumor, goes back and says, well, doctor, was it malignant? He, he says, yeah. How long I got to live? About six months to a year. He, did, he didn't say, you know, 10% of them do pretty well. And with the other treatments, they can live for a long time, like I have seen. Like I've seen that one recently lived seven, seven years. A very positive thinker. That patient had told me originally that I want to live seven years. I'm not going to die, doctor. And he didn't. Many years the man lived. And, went, and his scan, which I did about two weeks before he died, really looked normal. I think he died from uh, exha uh, exhaustion. The lady screamed all night, the second night. By the next day, she was dead. Well, what happened? What happened? Her negative thinking resulted in the adrenaline going up in the blood. Her blood pressure went up. Her heart started uh, fibrillating, and she developed a cardiac arrhythmia, and she died. This is not uncommon. This is called, the essence, the voodoo effect. She believed this thing was going to kill her, and it did very quickly. This time, a tiny tumor never should have done it. Never should have done it. That's the nocebo, the negative terminology. We have to be very careful how we talk to people. Their perceptions change. We can't overspeak the pathology or the x-rays. Spontaneous emissions occur, occur through immunology. Your immunity changes and leads to cures. Uh, for example, LeShan, who published books 45 years of treating uh, uh, terminal cancer, would take this patient with metastatic cancer of the breast spread all over the body. He walked her through the Museum of Modern Art, three blocks from where I used to live, and uh, would take her to lunch once a month. That was, her, that was her consultation. Then he walked her through the museum for a half hour, looking at her favorite art, not his, not the doctor's, her favorite art. He did it for five years. After five years, he restudied her, cured of her cancer. He clearly affected her immunity. Her thinking process affected her immunity. So to read Hushenegger's book, The Will to Live, which is on my website, cashformindbody.com. Look at my website. Uh, his book is there. The Will to Live is very important. Read Simonton's book. If you don't have cancer and your friend has it, give him these books. They're great books. I've given them. Uh, they're available at my Mind Body Institute uh, as well as online. I believe. I think it's very important to get the patient to believe in its recovery. Get rid of that negative thinking. Positive and negative expectations are extremely uh, important. What's cancer cell? It's a weak and confused cell. It's a reject. It's not a strong cell. Cancer begins with a cell with incorrect genetic information. Something's wrong with, the D with their uh, DNA. It's an injured cell. That's the reason your immunity can indeed uh, uh, kill it. Uh, 
We have a few cancer cells every day. We talked about that. White cells kill them. We make billions of cells daily. So a mistake, would that be a surprise? Heck no, that wouldn't be a surprise. So malignant cells are weak and disorganized, so we don't need to think so negatively about them. We know about what are causes of cancer. Most of us know a lot of what those are. Nicotine, tar, chemicals, uh, uh, drugs, loss of immunity, negative thinking, drugs, stress. Remember, I said stress can cause cancer, a very common cause of it. Uh, depression. Some people have a genetic predisposition. We all know about that. Fa cancer runs in families. I certainly have seen that. Diet is important and obesity. Fat causes, has 20 nasty chemicals in it, 20 nasty chemicals. And these chemicals cause inflammation, heart disease, diabetes, but they also cause cancer. Breast cancer is 20 to 30 percent of breast cancer due to obesity, to being overweight. So be a proper weight is extremely important. So when they raise a lot of money for cancer research, uh, I do think they should keep half the money in town here and send it for wellness teaching because you would cure diabetes, heart disease, and 30% of cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, much more common in overweight uh, individuals. So 20% at least to 30%, some people think, is caused by the diet, breast, prostate, colon. In Japan, there's very little cancer, although they're high smokers. Why is that? They eat a vegetarian diet. At least they did 15 years ago. I think it's changing. As those Japanese moved to Hawaii, we notice the cancer rates pick up. As they move to the U.S., they have the same cancer rate as we do, although they have a high rate of smoking. Smoking, of course, is horrible. It causes cancer. But I tell you what more commonly causes cancer, eating the wrong food. Obesity uh, affects uh, cancer rates much more, much more than smoking. We don't see pay any attention to that, though. Uh, so what you eat is extremely important. So cancer causes, again, put cancer cells in humans, and they're immediately destroyed transplant uh, story. Uh, there was a patient who needed a kidney transplant. They didn't know there was, a, there was a cancer sitting in the kidney. It's hidden. They didn't know it. They gave it to the cancer patient because his immunity had been reduced by taking steroids. Steroids reduce your immunity. It's the reason you shouldn't take steroids for years on end. They destroy your immunity. Uh, he developed that cancer in his kidney, spread to his lungs within a week. Within a week, he had a tennis ball sitting there. Then they realized what happened. Uh, they were totally shocked. They took this kidney. They took this kidney out. A week later, cancer was gone. Now that, that's an example of immunity, destroying the immunity, uh, curing the immunity. Very interesting. Where we talked about the, trans, the surveillance theory, where we make cancer cells every day. Uh, strong link between uh, stress and illness. That's the reason they have the mind-body index, which are, these diseases are caused largely uh, by stress. Stress reduces immunity. Dr. Hans Seeley from Montreal, a German like me, uh, published a thousand papers linking stress to immunity. A thousand. He, he then came out with the adaptation syndrome. We studied animals mainly. Uh, it would stress them. It was, the proof was so heavy that NIH no longer funds research on animals. You can no longer collect research money and stress animals to try to prove it. It's been proven. It's been proven. But it's chronic stress, long-term stress. I'm not talking about acute stress. The saber-toothed tiger runs at you. Is he going to kill you or not? Stress is over in a minute. But chronic stress that we experience every day uh, for, from work, uh, economics, from taxes. Uh, I can list you 30 things that are stressing people every day, uh, losing their job, uh, et cetera. That's what's killing America. That's what's killing America, causing us to eat too much, causing heart disease, diabetes, and causing uh, uh, cancer. Uh, on my website, uh, I wrote a book called Welcome to Your Mind Body. This is the book uh, right here, about 250 pages, telling you how, how your brain uh, can affect your body. It's a scientific uh, 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 proof of it. I have a stress test in there. I have a stress test in there. You can take it and, and add up the points and see how much of a stressed individual uh, that you really are. Uh, and your odds of developing one of my mind-body illnesses that I have on this graph behind me on my right, your left. Uh, but on page 160 in my book, there's a copy of it there, uh, incidentally. So when life is too hectic and coping fails, illness is the unhappy result, including cancer. People lose their job, get cancer three months later. Not uncommon. All animal research has stopped linking cancer and stress. The proof is 100% certain. So Hans Seeley, the doctor from Montreal, developed this general adaptation syndrome 
uh, which is that you lose your adrenal glands, uh, your heart rate goes up, your heart fails, your blood pressure goes up, your white cells go down, and you die for loss of immunity. That's the adaptation syndrome of Hans Seeley. Let me give you the best definition of stress. Listen to this very carefully. Write it down if you can. Inability to cope with perceived real or imaginary threats to our physical, emotional, and psychological well-being. That's a great definition of stress. Inability to cope with perceived, real, or imaginary threats to our physical, emotional, and psychological well-being. Seeley had another definition, the nonspecific response of the body to stress. He had a thousand definitions, but I think the first one I gave you, I think, is the best one. The individual. Uh, we, we differ in the amount of stress that we have. Uh, some people are much more susceptible to stress than others. Remember I said it's chronic, long-term stress that is, that is suppressing the immune system, not acute stress. Acute stress is over. You're in this accident, it's over in a minute. The tiger runs at you, it's over in a minute. You either live or die. Uh, it's chronic stress, the loss of white cells, and large adrenal glands, and large hearts, weight loss, and death, overeating. Uh, this is uh, what causes uh, cancer and mind-body diseases. Dr. Lawrence Sheehan, who published, remember I said books, 45 years studied terminal cancer. Then he wrote about it, published books about it, the guy from New York who lived down the street from me. I never met him there, but he said he's a foremost theorist of the psychology and life history of a cancer patient. Okay? And he had developed certain theories. I'm going to review them with you. Emotional factors and the causation of cancer. These are the things that he said existed. In a lot of these patients with cancer, in their youth, there was marked by feelings of isolation, despair, intense interpersonal relationships. Previous strong personal relationships that were removed by death, a move, divorce, and retirement. Many patients have told me they had a major move. They were moving to another part of the country. It happened recently to a friend of mine. I, I, I talked to him on the phone today, a, a great individual from, uh, 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 that I met. They moved to California, and what happened? Within two months, his wife comes down with cancer all over her body. I sent her these books, Getting Well Again, the Shan's books. And, and sent my tapes of visualization and imaging. She, I just talked to him today. She's better. I made her hopeful. She's better. A lot of these patients' despair was bottled up. The zest, the zest left their lives simply wanting to die. There's nothing else to live for. I have no purpose. I'm, I'm ready to die. Lachan said 76% of 500 patients which he studied with cancer had a history of emotional problems or severe stress. Only 10% of the control group without cancer had this problem. Other studies by Shmali, patients with cancer frequently had a history of hopelessness and frustration. Dr. Green, many patients with leukemia and lymphoma had a history of despair, hopelessness, and discontinuity. They lost discontinuity. They lost their job. Dr. Kissin, heavy smokers, the ones that have cancer, were found to have high rates of chronic stress. There's a book called out the China study, incidentally, that studied different parts of China. Billion people they studied. They found the cancer rates to be much higher where they ate fatty food, where the people were a lot more stressful. In the quiet communities outlying China where they ate vegetarian diets, and there wasn't much stress, very low cancer rates. Let me tell you the story of the uh, ranch hand from Simonton's book. This ranch hand was happily married, uh, and her husband died, uh, and within a few months she developed cancer. Then she fell in love with the ranch hand, and they got married. Her cancer went away. Then the ranch hand ran away with her money, and the cancer came back. It's right in his book. Stress, stress. We've heard stories of six, six kids and off to college. Now what? Breast cancer with metastasis. We've seen this happen to mother. The, the, the purpose has left their life. They're raising six or eight, seven kids, and all of a sudden, nothing. The immunity drops. Cancer rates go up. Retirement, now what? How many times have you heard that one? Higher rates of cancer immediately after retirement. People that have identity problems is what it is. Loss of coping. No purpose. This is where Lachan comes in. He found the most likely way to turn a cancer patient around to save their life 
is to establish a purpose in their life. He writes that over and over again. Something they wanted to do they had never done if they could afford it, to get a different job. Uh, you gotta have a purpose. He found a cancer patient who had no purpose in life. It's over, I can't work, lost my job, I can't work at GM, I have no other interest. Those are the people that die quickly. If he can establish some purpose in them, I think it's great. I read Rick Warren's book, A Purposeful Life, and I thought, see, you know, on the first page it says, God picked you, and I said, why would God pick me? And I did, didn't like the book that much, but I tell you, he has the right subject, A Purposeful Life. I reread it. I think it's a very good book. I think it's good, I think it's good to read. Uh, to have a purposeful life, you're lucky. I feel extremely lucky. I have a purpose. I'm teaching people mind-body medicine. I still do 300 operations a year. I have a purpose. I feel very fortunate. I get up excited every day and, and go to bed excited <laughs> every night because of my next book I'm going to write the next day or, or, or a dictator or my next lecture is coming up. I, I, I like to encourage you to develop a purpose in life. Do something you like to do. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. The happiest guy I know at Lufthansa Hospital is the guy that cleans the floors. Every day I walk in, doctor, look at these great floors. He's so happy and I compliment him every day. It doesn't have to be neurosurgery. It could be anything that you do. It could be anything. We're trying to promote, convert hopelessness to, and helplessness to hopefulness. To some patients, death is the solution. So The Purpose of Life by, the, by uh, the Rick Warren, I think is a good book to read. That Great Lachan's book, I think a very good book. These books are posted on my website. Po Here's another book, great book to read, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. Uh, he wrote a book called You Can If You Think You Can. Visualization and Imaging are the original books uh, that were uh, written by Norman Vincent Peale. I think God blessed me one day, and, and who walks in? Uh, one of his assistant ministers uh, comes in here, uh, and, and with his, uh, I thought it was his wife, he's 83 years old, it was his man's girlfriend. And, uh, and uh, he looks at the stuff, from the newspapers are written about me on my wall, and he comes in the next day and he says, you know, doctor, I used to work for Norman Vincent Peale. I very well know him because, I mean, knew about him because I lived in New York and, uh, and said, heard about him and, uh, and the great books which he had written. He says, I have every one of those books autographed by him and his wife, Ruth, and I'm going to give them to you as a present. Oh, my God. And then he looked me squarely in the eye and said, you know, doctor, I know you. You're going to read them. And I did. So I put them in a PowerPoint in my website, castformindbody.com. Lectures, purposeful life, uh, purposeful life, positive thinking, normal vision, appeal. Print them off. You will not believe it. The number of PowerPoints, 400. I can't believe it. Today's is only 40. <laughs> so, 400. But look at those periodically or print them off. They, they really improve your positive uh, thinking. Uh, let's face it, uh, this is very important. The upward spiral of recovery. With cancer, the individual gains a new perspective as his and her problem. We look at life differently. Some people feel relieved. All of a sudden, huh, I can do what I want to do. Some, after, usually patients who at first are very stressed and sometimes depressed, but many of them turn, turn this around, especially with some coaching, say, from my mind by the Institute. I have girls that are especially trained to teach that, uh, and, uh, and the life improves. So it's a new permission slip to act differently. Suspend the rules. New rules increase their psychology, psychological energy. Hope and renewed desire to live we need to instill in cancer patients, very important. So a change in the psychological state as well as a change in the physiological state. I mean, you get all the Western treatment, but also you have to treat the psychology. Unfortunately, many doctors today don't look at that, uh, a psychological aspect of it, but I'm serious. Uh, for medical school, these things aren't taught. These things are not taught in medical school. I know, I was uh, recently in Askham. Uh, so in Hutchenegger's book, The Will to Live, it's a very good book to read uh, if you have cancer or give it to a friend as a present who has cancer. Positive or negative expectations are very important you read in this book. Uh, maybe you have only six months to live, but tell them uh, that uh, 10 to 15 patients uh, do very well, and I'm going to put you in that 10%. I'm going to do everything that I can, and you give the patient a hug. The family needs to give the patient a hug and support them. Patients with cancer without families die much quicker. Positive attitude, attitude is more important than the disease, according to Dr. Simonton. A positive attitude is more important than the disease. Okay? There's a lot of negative thinking by medical providers and patients. You have only six months to live. Cancer is synonymous with death. It's not true. It's not true. 
75% do quite well. They then go through the drastic effects of surgery and chemo, and it, it's hard to convince them they're going to be well again. I understand that. 30 to 45% are cured by medicine. Another 25% live many years. We're starting to get up to 75%. At least 50% are helped by mind-body medicine. Many live twice as long and a much higher rate of spontaneous cure. Can't, positive expectancy it becomes very important. Modern medicine cures many patients. Your body's defenses are mortal enemies of cancer. Your army and air force and marines of your immunity can destroy cancer. So you have to work on improving it through positive thinking, through mind-body techniques. Medical and psychological treatments are a great help. This is not false hope. Marriage has only 50% success rate. And with cancer, you get a 75% success rate. Let's not be so pessimistic. So hope is very important uh, in cancer survival. We talked about my mind-body index in cancer. Uh, mind-body illnesses in cancer are much more common in patients who are depressed, despaired, who are hopeless, helpless. It causes mind-body diseases in cancer. The limbic system, which is above your hypothalamus in your brain, uh, records depression and despair. The hypothalamus below that is the metabolic center of your brain. It's the wizard of Oz of your brain that it regulates all these neuropeptides that are greatly influenced by your thought process. They're the ones that pull out the steroids that affect your uh, immunity. And we already talked about the neuropeptides, 350 of them, secreted by the brain and your immune cells. Recovery. Let's talk about recovery. How are you going to get well? First step, you should strengthen the belief of yourself or your patient in effectiveness of the treatment and potency of defenses and changes in perception. Get the latest uh, science. Uh, look it up on the internet. Uh, think positively. Teach the patient the will to live. Give your f friend or relative the books to read about the will to live. Have them read Simonton's book, Lachan's uh, book. I teach them stress reduction and possibly psychiatric treatment occasionally to see a psychiatrist, but that's not common. Just stress reduction, uh, like we do in our yoga studio. Uh, we teach people to dance. We uh, teach uh, people uh, proper eating. We give a meditation class every Tuesday night. Yeah, very cheap, too. It's very cheap, too. And then we teach people stress reduction, lecture after lecture, which can apply to any part of your life. And you have the patient has to participate in your health. So you have to identify the major stresses going on six to eight months previously and try to deal with them. And, and we have to convert hopelessness to, uh, to hopefulness. Uh, learn to relax and visualize recovery. Visualization, the language of the unconscious is very important. I'm going to teach you a little bit about that. Uh, the value of positive images. I had a patient who had uh, a bunch of tumors in his liver. And, uh, and I taught him to visualize a Pac-Man coming in eating up the tumor cells. I asked him to visualize a chemotherapeutic agent coming in there and bathing his tumor uh, with a red substance and shrinking the tumors, and he was urinating them out uh, as a red substance. I asked him to visualize uh, radiation bullets come in and destroying the tumor. They re-X-rayed him nine months later at Northwestern. Dr. Apple and Tom will confirm it. Scan was normal. I don't know if that did it. I'm not a charlatan. I don't know if it did it. Nobody else was doing anything. They didn't give him chemo. They didn't give him radiation because of those liver tumors. It wouldn't work. Maybe what I taught him worked. It's in the literature. Maybe, maybe it helped him. He certainly is a lot more hopeful, and he's doing very well today. He said repeated scans again. We will nothing. And uh, so let's create a future. Let's visualize a, a future. Let's set a goal. I'm going to watch Junior graduate from college. I'm going to attend this wedding. This thought process, well, remember the body knows how to get well. This thought process can lead you there, can lead you there. So increasing the will to live and creating a purpose, remember I said purpose, develop a purpose is very important. So mental imagery to make a, a picture, a, a visualization of it. This is how you speak to your unconscious mind. It's extremely important. Visualize yourself getting well. Teach yoga and mind control. Yoga is meditation. It's exercise, but it's meditation. Your mind concentrates in yoga. You think only of the present moment, and it's a, st a stress reducer. It's a very good uh, thing to do. To teach meditation is extremely important for stress control, very good for cancer patients. It has to do with your breath, which affects your autonomic ner nervous system, causes you to secrete endorphins. Your own morphine makes you feel better. Andre Rue, I don't know if you know him or not. Um, you see him in PBS. There is uh, money with him. I, I've met him. He's 
at least I consider him a friend. I don't know if he considers me a friend, but I, I travel with him in Europe, and uh, I can speak a couple languages. He, he, he liked that. He says, there is no greater force in the world than love. He has wonderful DVDs. If you have a, a person that likes semi-classical music, wants to feel a bit better, buy him the DVDs of, of Andre Rue. Uh, that they're really going to make you for two, two. It'll put you for two hours in another world. In another world, I've done that to many patients. I've given many of them away, actually. And, uh, and he says, there's no greater force in the world than love. The heart beats in the rhythm of three, just like the waltz. The Blue Danube is one of his favorite songs uh, that he plays, uh, and then he has people dance in the aisles. I've done it. I'm, one of his, I'm on one of his DVDs. Uh, Homecoming is the name of that one. Uh, and we, first week, read the books, The Will to Live, Mind as a Healer by Kenneth Politaire. That's another good one. It's on my website. Uh, Seeing the Mind's Eye by Mike and Nancy Samuels, another good book to read. Practice Relaxation Mental Imagery, three times daily for 10 minutes. Have an instructor teach you and have a CD. Let me tell you about mental energy, uh, imagery. I had a patient, tumor size of a tennis ball in his neck, about 30 years old. Uh, he uh, did some fishing on Lake Wabasee. I think he lived in Syracuse. I asked him to visualize, this is in October. I asked him to visualize coming out to my pier in Lake Wabasee and meet me for lunch at 2 p.m. on July 4th, nine months later. Mind you, he got cancer spell of his body from smoking. So I had my wife set up lunch for me and for him. She said, what are you doing? He says, I have a guest coming. Guess what? Who showed up in a fishing boat at 2 p.m. on July 4th last year. Then he held up two bass he just caught. He says, Doc, earlier today, I caught these under your pair. <laughs> I thought it was too funny. But isn't that a wonderful story? I mean, it's a wonderful story. I can hardly tell it without tears. Second week, practice relaxation and mental imagery again. Fill out stress questionnaire. The Holmes Ray test or the test that I've got in my mind body book, page 160, about stress and work on these things. Uh, start yoga, meditation, art. Art is healing. So to learn to do some art, I think is good. And music, obviously. I love music. And when you do the music, visualize the guy playing the instrument. Visualize the notes going across the screen. That's meditation. I'm down on the road on a way to work every day, and I'm visualizing the guy playing the saxophone, and I'm uh, visualizing uh, the notes going on down the music. I started to talk about saxophone four years ago, incidentally, and I can play it. Not real good, but I can play it. Can't believe I did that. I did that over Andre Rue, and uh, just because he didn't believe I could do it. And uh, so take out music. I think that's a great one. It builds your brain, too. Take a 30-minute walk every day. I think that's a good one. Communicate with nature. I talk to the animals. I talk, I talk to the flowers. I talk, I talk. My peonies today are so beautiful. My iris are so beautiful. In the morning, I stop my car as I'm leaving. They're right by the mailbox. And I talk to them. I talk to them for a few seconds. It, it, it's spiritual. It makes me feel good. And I think it makes them feel better. Learn to relax. Meditation, visualization. Get a massage. I like massaging. At any time, not just for cancer. Tai Chi, Qigong, these slow movements, all meditation and movement. Uh, we teach it at my Mind Body Institute. These are excellent for, for relaxation, for mind control. I now have at the Institute a real yoga instructor. God sent him to me two weeks ago. I mean a real yoga, yoga instructor. He's been in India. He's, he's worked with Chopra for two years. Uh, he dresses like one. He acts like one. I can't believe it. What a blessing. And he teaches Tai Chi, Qigong. Uh, Acupuncture, some people use. I, I believe in acupuncture. So progressive relaxation is another, and mental imagery very important in cancer patients. Uh, so imagery is the language of the subconscious mind. Tiger Woods, before he hits a golf ball, he, image, he, he, he images this thing. He visualizes a shot. He ain't thinking about hitting the ball. He just visualizes it landing on the green. He does it three times. Jack Nicklaus does the same thing. The best golfers are distinguished how well they visualize the shot. Before I hit my serve, I visualize it. I don't think I ought to hit it. I visualize it. They practice too much. They don't think about hitting the ball. We also uh, uh, and do it multiple times a, a day, three times a day at least. Visualize and, uh, if you have a cancer problem or any problem you're trying to solve, like trying to lose weight, whatever. Uh, there are CDs made, made for that, too. We have some also that are good to listen to in your car. Uh, many meditative techniques are based on the breath. So breathing is very important here. Bring yourself to the center, the now, live in the now. Not the tsunami, the past, the storm, the future. Right now. Things are well right now. 
Uh, if you can't quiet your mind, use a mantra. A mantra is mind energy. Use a word, Jesus, God, Muhammad, whatever. Uh, there are some famous uh, mantras used by gurus. Uh, a famous one is Om Guru Dev Namo. I use that one. That's the most famous mantra there is that causes vibration of your hard palate and soft palate, which can affect your pituitary and hypothalamus. At least that's the thought of it. I doubt the scientific proof behind that. And another one I like is Satnam, Satnam, Satnam. In the mornings, my blood pressure can be borderline a little bit, and I'll sit there, take about 10, 20 real deep, relaxing breaths, close my eyes, visualize walking to the head of my pier, looking at the sunset of Lake Wawasee, and I say, Satnam, Satnam, Satnam. Then I check my blood pressure down 20 points every time, every time. So breathing techniques, meditative techniques can have great value, not just uh, for cancer. So the language of motivational psychology, imaging, positive expectations, Norman Vincent Peale stuff, a purposeful life, purposeful life, extremely important, the world to live, a shower of positive neuropeptides, hormones, and neurotransmitter all over your body, your odds of healing yourself a great deal better from all these stress diseases as well as uh, uh, cancer. So what's the mental imaging uh, process? Meditation, breath centering, a quiet mind, relaxed body, using a mantra, repeat the words to quiet your mind, and then visualize, then visualize. That's more likely to accomplish what you plan to uh, get done. So think and visualize, uh, and you'll destroy the weak and confused cancer cells. Draw a picture of the cancer cells, so, and, and draw on there the Pac-Man coming in, the, the bullets uh, uh, coming in, the chemo coming in, destroy them. Draw a picture. Art can be very helpful. Look at the picture every day. Your brain may lead you to it. It'll affect your immunity. Uh, brain, so uh, art is very important in treatment of cancer. Uh, see the radiation beams coming in and bullets coming in, destroying your cancer. Picture the chemo drug coming in, destroying uh, your cancer. Watch yourself urinating out the cancer cells. Remember, your body knows how it's doing well. Picture your white cells destroying your cancer. Overwhelm them, a shower of white cells coming in and destroying them. Do it about three times a day for five minutes. Picture the cancer shrinking. Visualize yourself as having no pain, a normal person. I've worked with cancer patients that I've seen it. The pain just went away, although they canceled the bone. I couldn't believe it. And it, it works. It works. Uh, draw a real picture demonstrating what you did. Remove hopelessness and, 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 and helplessness and uh, convert it to hopefulness. Decrease fear. Regain a sense of control. A commitment. Increase the will to live. Create a purpose. This can cause physical changes in your body and alter your beliefs. Pray. Pray for it. It's a tool to communicate with the unconscious mind. Decrease tension and stress. Criteria for effective imagery. Cancer cells are weak and confused. Treatment is strong and powerful. Healthy cells have no difficulty repairing any slight damage uh, that other cancer cells might do. The army of white cells is vast and overwhelms the cancer cells. White cells are aggressive, eager for battle, quick to seek out the cancer cells and destroy them. Look at the army, the Air Force, and the Marines coming and destroying your cancer. By the end of imagery, you're healthy and free of cancer. See yourself reaching your goals in life, fulfilling your, your life's purpose in life. The Secret of the Nun Diet, Eat a Proper Diet. A, I have a book coming called, called The Secret of the Nun Diet. It'll be out in about a month. It's finished. It'll be on, on uh, Amazon on my website uh, with, for adults and children, two different books. What's The Secret of the Nun Diet? Complex carbs, whole grain, vegetables, legumes, fruit, all you can eat. Try to avoid high cholesterol, high fatty meat, high fatty cheeses. Fish a couple times a week is fine. Eat omega-3, very important because omega-3 leads to your uh, iconosoids. Those are the intel chips of your body. They affect your uh, immunity. So to take omega-3 is extremely important every day. It's important for heart disease, for diabetes, also for cancer prevention. Take a multivitamin. If you eat uh, this secret of the non-diet, you, all you can eat, you don't have to watch it, you don't have to count calories because this is healthy food. I'm telling you to eat healthy food. My goal, have mind-body medicine available to all cancer patients. Almost all patients become hopeful with this approach. It increases the will to live. Cancer patients are happier 
It may double their lifespan and increase the chances of spontaneous cure. There's science behind this. The public is aware of this. Every patient I've talked about this uh, feel much more hopeful. I think I've got a couple of spontaneous cures out there. It's not a substitute for Western medicine. This is in addition. Unfortunately, medical doctors are not really well trained in this, uh, although what I presented today is in the medical literature. It's scientific, and I think it's worthwhile if you have this problem or you know someone who has this problem to, to help them, get them read these books, send them to our Mind Body Institute. I have well-trained people that can deal, deal with it. Uh, I think these are very loving instructors uh, that, I, that I have. Uh, thanks so much for listening. I really enjoyed talking to you. And I also have many other mind body uh, lectures available on, on uh, DVDs on my website. I have uh, six of them now readily available, uh, very, very uh, cheap. Everything how your mind affects your body for mind and cancer, the mind and stress, the mind and pain, everything about the mind. If you say, well, doctor, you're not a neurosurgeon, you're a mind body doctor. If that's what you say, I would love it. I tell you honestly, I'm both. I feel like a doctor. You know what the word doctor means? Teacher. That's what it means, teacher. I feel like I am a teacher. Thank you for listening. <laughs>